Once again, we want to say how thankful we are for your attendance here today, especially to our guests. If you don't mind, guests, please pass those cards to the inside aisle and be picked up at this time. A company held an inter-office softball game once a year between the marketing staff and the support staff. It seemed like every year the marketing staff won, except one year, one year, somehow the support staff uh, came back and won the game. But the marketing staff got the last word in, because the very next day they posted this memo on the bulletin board. They said, the marketing staff is pleased to announce that we came in second place in the recent softball season after losing just one game. Sad to say, the support department, however, had a rather dismal season, winning only one game all year long. It's funny. It's amazing how people can be somewhat accurate in what they say well, about actually telling the complete truth about what they're really saying. Often our politicians do this. Their words, their words sound accurate, but often they're misleading. You look around. Our nation has somewhat lost its moral footing. We see school shootings. We see alternate lifestyle. We see drug abuse, we see abortion, we see murder. I'm telling you, now is the time. Now is the time for God's people to speak up, speak out, and speak clearly. In many ways, Nehemiah faced a very similar situation in his day. He had led an effort to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. But sad to say, it took him 12 years to rebuild the people. They had made a commitment. They had made a commitment to God's Word, to, to honor God's Word, to obey God's Word. And Nehemiah felt that he had accomplished the job that God had uh, given him. So he went back to his old job as cupbearer to the king. But then he thought, I need to go back. We need to have a dedication service for the wall. And I need to check on the progress of the people. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, he was dismayed. Because what he saw did not make him very happy at all. He saw people who had cast aside their commitment to God. He saw people who had forsaken their moral foundation. And he saw people who had forgotten God, the God who was the giver of all. Look at Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 1. On that day they read from the book of Moses, in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite shall ever enter the assembly of God. What did Nehemiah do? When he got back, he saw the problems. He said, we've got to go back to the source. The source is God's Word. He had God's Word read to the people. He didn't share opinions. He didn't offer his own commentary. He just let the Word of God speak for itself. And it had a profound effect on those who heard it. You see, the Bible is somewhat like a tiger. You let it loose and it will change people's lives. That's what happened in the days of Nehemiah. And I believe it can happen in our day too. So what must we do? We must stand on the Word of God. Just read the Bible and declare it. Let it loose and let it do what God designed it to do. In 1996, a group of climbers climbing Mount Everest faced tragedy as several died that year. 
One of those who died was Andy Harris. Andy stayed up at the peak way past the deadline. And as he traveled back down to the base camp, he got in trouble. He was deprived of oxygen. He was struggling. He radioed for help. The base camp reminded him, well, there's several canisters all along the trail, canisters of oxygen. Just hook yourself up to one of those canisters. You'll be okay. He had a canister in his hand. He started arguing for them. His oxygen-deprived mind, he could not read the meters correctly. And he kept on arguing that the canister was empty when actually it was full. The very thing he held in his hand was becoming absent in his brain and was ravaging his capacity to recognize the truth, resulting in his death. That describes so many people today in today's world. Their brain likes the life-giving oxygen of God's Word. It's killing them even though we're surrounded by the Bible. The Bible is out there. We can have, we got copies of the Bible. We got free Bible apps. We got Bible podcasts. We've got Bible videos. In spite of the abundance of the Word of God, so many people in our world pay so little attention to God's Word and even less apply it. God's Word is the key. What did Paul say? Romans chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel. What is it? It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So that's where we must begin. If we want to see our community changed, and we do, we've got to start with the Bible. Like Nehemiah, we must put the gospel before the people not basing ourselves on our own opinions, but proclaim what God has said. Rudrow Wilson, as our nation was facing a, a time of war, said this, There are a good many problems before the American people today and before me as president, but I expect to find the solution of those problems just in the proportion that I am faithful in the study of the Word of God. He looked to the Word of God for answers, and that's where we must look today. For God's Word alone has the answer to our country's problems. So stand on the Word of God. And then use it, first of all, to do what? To clean up God's house. Before we could clean up our community... Before we can make our community a better place to raise our children and grandchildren, we must make sure that our act is totally together. Look back at Nehemiah 13. Look at verse 4 and 5. What is happening? There's a problem. The high priest, the high priest himself, had set up a place for Tobiah, an Ammonite, to live right in the temple complex. Now God's law was very clear. No Ammonite was to participate in the temple worship. And yet this Ammonite is living in the temple complex itself. This is the same guy who had opposed the rebuilding of the wall. This is the same guy that had been a, a thorn in Nehemiah's side and a general pain in the neck. And he's living inside the temple. How could that be? What had caused it? The old saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play, certainly applies. Look now at verse 6 and 7. While Nehemiah was gone, the high priest took advantage of the situation and invited his son-in-law, Tobiah, to live in the temple. What does Nehemiah do? He's a man of action. Verse number 8. And I was very angry. And I threw out all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders 
and they cleanse the temple, the chambers. And I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. Can you picture that? Nehemiah is shaken with anger. He has got righteous anger here. He tosses out Tobias' stuff. He fumigates the room and restores that room to the proper use. Then he found out why the room was available for Tobiah. Look at verse number 10. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. This was a room where they had storage and they were supposed to give for the support of the Levites. But the people had stopped giving. So that the Levites and the singers who did the work, they had to have a way to support themselves. So what did they do? They had fled back to the fields to work themselves in the fields. The people had not kept the promises they had made in chapter 10. They had stopped giving to support the temple worship. And now look at verse 11, 12, and 13. Nehemiah, he's a man of action. What does he do? He not only rebukes the religious leaders, and he tells them, you're wrong. He replaced some of them, and he restored real worship in the temple. Now, it may seem somewhat strange to you and me that a godly man would get angry, that he would toss a person out of the temple and he would fight with the religious leaders. But you know, that's exactly what Jesus did in the temple. Not once, but twice. He tossed out the money changers out of the temple. You see, being godly, does not mean you give in all the time. It does not mean being a a pushover. It, It means taking a stand against evil wherever it's found. It means standing up for God in His causes. Nehemiah stood against the evil in his day. Standing on the Word of God, he cleansed God's house. And that's exactly what we need to do today. When there's sin and shortcoming in the church, we must deal with it. We have to ask ourselves the question, are we the church that God intended for this community? Are we the example of the love of Jesus to this community? Are we serving the needs the way that Jesus served the needs of people? Are we standing up for the right? Or are we barely heard in this community? Then and only then if we stand up and take care of our shortcomings, can we address our community sins? And then and only then can we clean up our community. That's what Nehemiah did. When Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem, he saw not only Tobiah in the temple, but he saw merchants on the street on the Sabbath. Verse 15. In those days, I saw in Judah people treading wine presses. When? On the Sabbath. And bring it in heaps of grain and loaded them on donkeys, and also wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem when? On the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. They were disobeying God's law. And they were violating the oath they had made back in chapter 10 when they said, we will honor and keep the Sabbath. So what does Nehemiah do? Once again, he's a man of action. Verse number 17. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing that you are doing? Profaning the Sabbath day. Did not your fathers act in this way? 
And did not our God bring all the disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. He confronts them. He says, you're not right in doing this. This is what got us in trouble before. And guess what? You're doing it again. He takes more action. Look at verse 19. And as soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the door should be shut. We're not going to let them in here to barter and sell and trade. The door should be shut and gave orders that they should not be open until after the Sabbath. He takes action. Nehemiah took a stand on God's word against evil because he wanted the people to obey God. We must Stand against evil. We must stand on God's Word. One religious group said this about the subject of abortion. They said, The Supreme Court of the United States is not the final authority, nor is culture itself. The Bible is God's final authority about marriage, and on this book we stand. Amen. That's not an easy thing to say in our culture today. That's not an easy position to take in our society today. But guess what? When we're silent, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. You're speaking the wrong message. Not to act is to act, is to act in the wrong way. Amen. The Lord's church today needs to speak with that kind of clarity if we want to hope to see our nation turn back to God. It's time to clean house. So standing on God's Word, we clean up God's house, we clean up the community, and most important, we clean up your house. It comes down to me and, and you. More than anything else, put your own, own home in order. It does us no good to call our religious and community leaders to account if we do not call ourselves to account. That's what Nehemiah did. Look at verse 23. In those days also I saw the Jews who had done what? They had married outside. They had married the women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. This was a sin against God's law and contrary to the promise they had made back in chapter 10. And then it says, verse 24, referring to these children of these foreign wives, about half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. None of them could read the Hebrew Scriptures or participate in the temple service. What had happened? A generation had fallen away. If a generation is lost to the faith, can there be any hope for the future of a nation? Then look at verses 25 through 31. Nehemiah here takes drastic action. He's really hot. He's really angry. He's pulling out their hair. He's driving them away. He's very concerned about what? About God's children. Keeping God's word. Being pure. Being obedient. They had allowed evil into their own homes. And now they're in danger of losing the faith altogether in just one generation. And Nehemiah takes action. These were desperate times. 
So Nehemiah got desperate in his zeal to clean up the mess that the people had made. And that's what we must do today to see our country turn back to God. Now, I'm not recommend, recommending pulling out people's hair. Don't get me wrong, please. But I think you, you understand what my message is. We must stand up for God and godly values. Desperate times require desperate actions, especially when it comes to your family and my family. I like this quote. At the end of your life, you'll never regret not having passed one more test, not having won one more victory, or not closing one more deal. But you will regret time that you did not spend with a spouse, a friend, a child, or a parent. If you have children, they must come first. Our success in this society depends on not what happens in Washington, but what happens inside your house. What is happening in my house? And what is happening in your house? Do I need to clean up my house? Would Jesus be pleased with the, the TV shows that I watch? Would the Lord be saying amen to the activities that we take apart and do at our house? Would God, would God be saying, well done, good and faithful servant, when He looks at my time and how I spend my time in my house? Get rid of those things that don't belong. Let's lead our families. Let's lead our families to God. We do it. We do it because we love God. We depend on the Lord. We lean wholly on Him. And He will begin the process of transformation when we turn our lives over to Him. First in your house then in this house, then in our community, and then in our nation. I'm very proud of something that my favorite baseball team does every Sunday for Sunday home games. They pay a very noted opera singer to come to the ballpark. And during the seventh inning stretch, everybody stands, including the hometown players, they're required to. And that guy, in that perfect voice, that perfect singing voice, he sings, God bless America, land of thy love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean white with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. I love this nation. I love our community. I love our church. Let's stand on God's word. Let's stand for what it means. And let's make a difference right here in Hot Springs. Are you a Christian? Once again, I remind you those simple steps to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That puts you into Christ. Those are not my words. Every verse are words from Jesus Himself. Most of us here have done that. Praise be to God. But sometimes as a Christian, we don't live and act like a Christian. We can seek His forgiveness. It's wonderful that He will forgive. 1 John 1, 9. This church is ready to pray with you and for you. James 5, 16. We'll have two elders up here waiting for you to make that step. We pray you do it this morning. We please come and we stand in theme for your encouragement. Bring Christ joy.